All right, thanks, and welcome to the continuation to the Earth, Ocean, Geo, and Atmospheric Science mini symposium. Our next speaker is Hillary. Please go ahead, Hillary. Okay, thanks. Um, so my name's Hillary. I'm a postdoc uh, here at Columbia at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. And uh, more importantly, I'm an oceanographer, and so I'm coming to you with my oceanography hat on today. And um, I'm excited to present some work that we've been doing over the past year, where we're looking at the, the spatial temporal evolution of marine heat waves. And in doing this project, it led into uh, forming a standalone Python package. And so I'm gonna be presenting that, but also talking a lot about marine heat waves. And so I'll first start by describing what a marine heat wave is. Um, I just first throwing up the abstract up here, but uh, I wanna thank our funding. So the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, I have some contact. Hillary, can you reshare your screen? We can't see your slides. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, definitely. Let me do this. All right, how about now? It looks like it's coming in. Yep, now we saw an abstract. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, so I'll just flash back to the first slide um, just to show my awesome contributors and collaborators. And um, so, Let's talk about sea surface temperature to start off with. So this is a really remarkable um, uh, graph here showing the average sea surface temperature taken across the globe. And this is data um, measured from satellites, but also taken from buoys and shipboard observations. And what it's showing is this very long term warming trend um, from the 19, early 1980s through present. And so as the climate warms due to anthropogenic greenhouse gases, the ocean accepts a lot of this heat and that's shown here. But what you really see, there's this warming trend, but there's a lot of variability on top of this trend. And so if you take um, a map of the ocean and you compute this trend at every single um, point that you have data for, you'll see kind of uh, patterns emerge and it looks really um, heterogeneous. And so there's areas of the ocean that are warming quite faster than others. And um, there's many reasons for this, but one of the important results of this is that it can cause marine heat waves to form in some regions more frequently than others. <clears throat> and so just to illustrate this a little um, further, here is just a synthetic time series made to represent um, sea surface temperature anomaly. So deviations from normal, where everything that is yellow or red, that's a warmer sea surface temperature. Everything that's blue is a cooler sea surface temperature. And you'll notice there's no trend in this um, kind of synthetic time series. The chances of getting a really warm event are just as likely as getting a really cold event. And so um, if we think about the impacts of marine heat waves and the species, uh, the response in the, in the ecosystem, these natural temperature fluctuations that have been happening for hundreds and hundreds, thousands of years, species can cope with that. They've adapted to this range of temperature. And often if, um, you know, a particular ecosystem gets too warm, a lot of species are able to move away and find areas that um, they can, uh, that they, they like better. And so some examples of that are um, highly migratory fish species like tuna, um, hammerhead sharks can uh, seek relief in colder temperature to colder temperatures, humpback whales and whale sharks. So these, these species are capable of moving away from uh, a particularly warm environment to find some cooler water. Now what happens if we now warm the climate? And so <clears throat> that trend is increasing. So looking at the end of this time series in a climate change scenario, those warm extremes are becoming uh, more frequent and you can even see that they might be lasting a little longer. They're definitely uh, more extreme than anything we've seen before in kind of this happy um, scenario where it's equal chances of hot and cold. And so this is where we run into problems and we see responses in the ecosystem that are quite devastating. So for instance, you might see entire coral um, reefs 
bleach because of the warm temperatures. Uh, there's been mass die off of certain uh, fish species and especially ones that are commercially valuable. Sometimes whales change their migration patterns. Um, they can get caught up in fishing gear. Um, they appear in places where otherwise they wouldn't normally be because they're trying to follow their food that might have shifted due to the warming temperatures. And then also, um, you know, the warming impacts the food chain. And so this trickles down to an event a few years ago where sea lion pups couldn't uh, find enough food to survive. And um, you saw a lot of scenes like this here. So um, when we think about marine heat waves, we're talking about these events that exceed some threshold that we define over a usually 30 year time period. And so um, the threshold here is shown in this dashed red line. And so when the temperature anomaly exceeds that, we consider it a, um, a marine heat wave. And there's many ways you can define a marine heat wave. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about kind of how we define it in our, um, our case, just a moment. Um, just to give you a perspective of how big these events can be, here's a map showing you that sea surface temperature anomaly during marine heat waves. And this is composited onto a globe, so it's showing different events that occurred in different years. And so what you can see is that these events can be quite large especially the one in the Northeast Pacific. It really um, took over this, this region and it persisted for multiple years. Other events can be um, more regionally focused, <clears throat> like in the Tasman Sea, <clears throat> excuse me, or off Western Australia. And so there's something going on here where there's um, you know, marine heat waves that have some kind of spatial scale that maybe these point-wise analyses, they're missing something. Um, and also they don't just stay in one place. And one way to kind of show you this is an animation <clears throat> showing you the sea surface temperature anomalies that exceed that threshold. So these are the marine heat wave anomalies. And it's playing, uh, this is monthly data and it's going forward in time. And I put an X on there um, just to show you how these marine heat waves can move through points. They can grow, expand and shrink. And so I, I think they're quite um, interesting phenomenon to characterize. And before OSTRAC, we, we weren't really able to do this. So um, some of the motivations, like I kind of hinted at, is the marine heat waves, they don't stay in one place. So if you had a buoy, a fixed buoy at a certain location and you wanted to measure marine heat waves there, well, you're probably not going to be able to capture the entire story because your focus is pretty narrow. <clears throat> they have complex spatial connectivity and temporal behavior. So connectivity is an important <clears throat> term that will come up um, now and again. And that's how um, certain points in the ocean are connected and um, uh, how you define the marine heat wave area is these points that are connected. Um, and then I'll just move on because of time. Uh, so the goals of OSTRAC, uh, we want to identify marine heat waves, not at just a single point, but we want to look at an image of the ocean from sea surface temperature and be able to identify marine heat waves as 2D objects. And then once we have those objects, we want to be able to follow them in time and space, to track them in other words and then to curate a new data set where we have more um, a rich spatial temporal information about marine heat waves that we can then probe to better understand these events and how they're gonna change in the future. Okay, so I'm gonna run through an example showing you how to use OSTRAC, uh, a very simplistic one. So here I'm taking a data set from NOAA, it's called the Optima Interpolation Sea Surface Temperature Data Set, and I'm doing uh, taking monthly means from September through present, and this is a quarter of a degree grid. So it's a really nice data set. It's, it's clean, it's been bias corrected, it's ready to go. From this data set, we want to compute the sea surface temperature anomalies, so um, relative to some reference period, and that's shown on the bottom map. And then from those anomalies, we're gonna compute a threshold and only take those anomalies that exceed it. And that's what you're seeing on the, the top map there. So that's like that video I showed earlier. These are the really extreme marine heat wave anomalies. And we're gonna use a 90th percentile. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to mention that the NOAA OISST dataset is available. Anyone can use it 
Um, it's on S3 compatible uh, object storage. And uh, we're using tools from Pangeo Forge. So this converts the NetCDF source files from NOAA into a czar store. And there's some links there where you can read more about the Pangeo Forge project. And if you have a data set that you want on the cloud, you can actually submit a recipe and they can get your data on the cloud. All right, and here's um, here I'm opening the, the OASST data set. At the end of the talk, there's a binder link so you can um, go through and run these cells. Um, we create a DAS cluster, um, and then here are our steps in data processing. You calculate the sea surface temperature anomaly, you identify the threshold and the anomalies that exceed that. And then once you have this image, the next step is to convert this into um, this image, you want to convert this into a binary map. So what I mean is that where you have these extreme points, you label those as uh, one, and then where you don't, it's a zero, and that includes land. Okay, so this is what the binary map would look like. So you have these points of interest and that everything else is background. And you can start to see that this isn't just specific to marine heat waves, you could really do this for any kind of um, uh, phenomenon you're interested in or feature where you can mask out the background noise and to identify um, the, the thing of interest. Okay, then after we have that binary image, we run it through um, SciPy Indie image, uh, a morphological uh, package where it does uh, opening and closing. And so, I'll, um, opening pretty much dilates your image, closing kind of erodes it away. And so this is a way to smooth the contours of the image while also um, eliminate any kind of small heat islands that might exist. Um, I won't go too much into this just because we don't have a lot of time, but in OSHTRAC, there's a parameter called radius. And this is what radius is um, defining the size of the structuring element that is used to scan over your image to, um, to do morphological opening and closing. And here's an example of this very simplistic. You have a binary image and a structuring element and you're passing the structuring element across your image to erode or dilate the object. So here's an example. So here um, is a binary image where it's been dilated, then eroded. That's closing. So you can see it fills small holes in the features. And then opening is where you erode, then you then also erode and then redilate to uh, end up in your resulting image. And so here's just a, a, a nice example of your resulting um, closed contours of the object. Uh, once you have all those objects, then um, you can calculate the area. And we do this and we form a distribution. <clears throat> and so we're really interested in these very large persistent marine heat waves and not so much the smaller, what we call heat islands that might represent an eddy or something like that. That could be a different project. And so we define this threshold and we only keep those objects that are larger than the threshold. Okay, so once we have our labeled objects, the final thing is to track them in space and time. And so we define another connectivity element. This, this time it is a, a cube essentially. And so where um, the objects are connected in either X or Y, so lat or lawn and time, they share the same ID. And so another feature of this is that marine heat waves can um, merge, come together, or split, and the um, the marine heat wave remembers the history of where it um, kind of was at the last step and where it's going. And so this ID is continued through uh, the life cycle of the, the event. So just to over uh, an overview of OSHTRAC, because it was pretty quick, there's a pre-processing step that is not involved in OSHTRAC that you have to do before you feed in your binary image. OSHTRAC takes care of the, um, the, the object detection, so the morphological operations, the size thresholding, and the tracking. All right, so how to run OSHTRAC. So um, this top cell here, I'm just defining some of my parameters that you want 
uh, that OSHAC requires. And so you need a, a data array. Um, we use X-Array, um, and I'm just showing you a, a slice of the data set here. The radius, so the radius is, um, is eight here, and that essentially is eight grid points. And so I have a quarter of a degree data, and so that's about um, two grid points. The min size quartile, that's when you take that distribution, you find the 75th percentile and you accept all objects that exceed that threshold. And then you supply at the X and Y demands. Okay, and what OSHTRAC gives you is the minimum area. So the number of pixels that you've essentially um, determined you set in your parameter as the 75th percentile. So it's, that's the smallest size object that OSHTRAC is finding the initial objects identified. And so that's before it's um, kind of eliminated objects because they are too small. And then the final is the resulting tracked um, objects that have been size filtered and also connected in time. So you can see how much it shrinks the data set down after you track them. So what do we get? So I ran this through um, and this is accessible on Binder. Here is a snapshot of um, September 1981. And so each different color on there is a, a distinct marine heat wave. And so you can kind of see the size and shape of what they look like after OSHTRAC. Um, and if we zoom in on one event that lasted four months here, this is event off the Eastern, in the Eastern Indian Ocean off Western Australia. And you can kind of see this event, it hung around pretty much in a, in a similar area. It didn't go very far and the, the shape, it, it grew and then kind of shrunk back down. So already we're getting some really interesting information from OSHTRAC um, and finding uh, this particular event. So here's what, <clears throat> if we look back on the SST anomaly field, this is the contours here are the, um, the boundary of the objects that OSHTRAC detects. So this is a connected event here. And this is just showing you how well it does. Um, if you were just to look at the background uh, sea surface temperature anomaly field, it'd be very difficult for you to <clears throat> draw this contour by hand. OSHTRAC takes care of that in a um, somewhat objective way to do that for you. Um, right. And so you can look at even further into this, look at more metrics using um, region props. And um, you can find the events area, you can look at the mean intensity and max intensity. So that this is the example from that um, Indian Ocean marine heat wave I just showed you. Okay, other examples. Uh, here are just some videos I made a while ago. Um, and this is actually a real marine heat wave. I mean, they're all real, but this one was talked about in the news. It was a big deal. This is uh, the Northwest Atlantic Gulf of Maine marine heat wave during the summer of 2012. And this was really cool to see because it really followed our expectations of how this event progressed. But now we have <clears throat> this quantified um, data set <clears throat> where we can further understand the event. Another one, and this was very unusual, um, I don't know if you've heard of the blob. <clears throat> so this happened um, in 2013 and it persisted um, for many years. And um, it was uh, a big deal, I think for people in the US, it had a lot of impacts. And this is what OSHTRAC picks up on. And so because the marine heat wave can merge and come back together, you can really kind of trace this event way back, um, even into the South Atlantic. Um, before it kind of progressed into the north Northeast Pacific. Um, and so it's really interesting to look back, run this OSH track, look back and identify marine heat waves <clears throat> where you know you have a good sense of, you know, why this event occurred, when it occurred, and, and then to see how OSH track identifies it. Okay, so we did this for all marine heat waves in this data set. And um, this is just an example of some of the statistics you can draw from it. And so, um, and then plotting on where, how the blob and the, the Northeast Pacific marine heat wave and the Gulf of Maine marine heat wave compared to all the others. And you can see that 
what I'm calling the blob here, was quite unusual. Okay, so I'm wrapping up here. So what <clears throat> new insights does OSTRAC reveal about marine heat waves? Um, so we've kind of seen these two different patterns evolve. Uh, there's events that tend to be more localized. They don't travel very far compared to ones that seem to be globally connected. And we find that the tropics um, played a very important role in connecting these global marine heat waves. And that's likely because of the importance of um, tropical variability like El Nino. Um, the marine heat waves that are globally connected tend to last longer. It's not surprising. Um, and they are more intense. Uh, so I mentioned the tropics are very important for these very large and persistent marine heat waves. And the idea that these marine heat waves can split and then merge is a pretty, is a new idea and an exciting idea to um, kind of explore in, in, in the realm of how these events are connected. So why should you use OSTRAC? This is definitely not limited to marine heat waves. Um, any kind of um, problem or um, data set where you have spatially and temporally varying um, data, you could use OSTRAC. Um, so you can characterize new spatial patterns. Um, you can create a new catalog of these, um, these events uh, and maybe learn something new about the phenomenon you're looking at. And so, so far we've, we've done this with temperature, looking at marine heat waves, and now we're moving into looking at salinity extremes. And so this is really exciting. And eventually we wanna go and look at eddies. Um, but you could also, uh, if, if you're into, the, uh, into oceanography, you could look at ocean extremes, nutrients, pH, harmful algal blooms. You can even uh, track El Nino um, heat anomalies around um, with OSTRAC. Okay, so I'll take questions now um, without just one final word here is we'd love for people to use OSTRAC and try it out. We provided a binder link here with, um, it's connected to Pangeo. Everything's there and ready to run. Um, and um, yeah, get in, feel free to get in touch. All right, thank you so much. That was, as an, as an ocean archer myself, I really particularly enjoyed that, but you've clearly done some really awesome work separate from oceanography as well. And we have a number of questions here I'd like to uh, get to. Sure. So um, I won't start with my own question, <laughs> um, but Scott, um, is, is the 90th percentile what used for all time and maybe in particular, is it different with season or is that an important factor? Yeah, so um, that's a very important question because when we look at the anomalies, they're with respect to the seasonal cycle. And so marine heat waves can happen as um, often in the winter as they can in the summer. The 90th percentile is then computed with respect to that seasonal cycle. And you can fix the climatology over a 30 year period or extend it over the entire temperature record. Um, whether you're interested in the trend or not. And you can use the 95th percentile, percentile, the 90th percentile. Um, I think that's about the range you wanna go with. Okay, yeah, I could imagine that um, what you choose, you know, affects your results. And mm -hmm. uh, for all of these, um, all of the parameters you have to choose. And I was also wondering about this question, how, how you track different blobs together between splits and merges. Like as you showed the big, I forget what it's called, the big blob or the heat blob or something that was in the, the blob. News. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, like how do you know, or how did you, how does the analysis know that it's the same blob all the way all over the place? I think yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a great question. It's not something that we, um, we implemented ourselves. It's in, we use Dask, the Dask image library ND measure sub package. And so what I, this, what I think it's doing is it's running, um, running the day, the, the package forward and backwards across your data. And so that way it's like you're tracking forward and backwards and that way you can match up um, objects that were, you know, the child of this parent in a way. Hmm. Um, it's not, yeah, it's not something that we 
did ourselves. Uh, this was already in the, the package that we used from Dask Image. And that is what specifically translates to IDs between splitting and merging? Yes, so the ID then is um, relabeled for those, or not relabeled, but it is um, labeled consistently when it is split and when it merges. Oh, it kind of does the labeling at the end. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, here's a question of mine, uh, another question of mine. Um, if the eroding and dilating I found really interesting. As I've thought about some image processing um, before myself, and I think that would have really helped some of the things I was working on. Mm -hmm. um, is this something that is standard practice in other fields, or did you bring it in from somewhere, or were you did you come up with it by necessity, needing to having all these little pieces of stuff that were disconnected? Yeah, so it's definitely not something that I came across in oceanography. Uh, I did kind of borrow it from the computer vision. Um, image processing field. Um, but yeah, it, it worked for, for us. It seems it kind of like we fell upon it and um, it was a really nice way to uh, smooth out the edges of those objects that were, were identifying. And, um, and I think that, you know, there's different combinations. So in Oshtrack, we did a closing, then an opening. You could do opening, then closing. You kind of have to play around with it to see what result works best. But I, I don't believe there's like a set way that you would go about doing it. It's kind of like, um, you know, you're building your own recipe with these operations. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay, I think we have one time for one more quicker question. How do you handle the 180 degree or 360 degree seam? Oh my goodness, that, that was very difficult. I had to write my own function um, to essentially wrap, um, wrap the relabel the IDs across the prime meridian. Um, I think that's what this question is referring to, and um, it's not you know, inherent in the packages that we, we used. So that was um, something we had to kind of add on. That's always a big pain. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, we better stop there for time. Um, thank you so much for your talk. And just for people who are sticking around in the session, we have kind of a lunch break now, and then we'll be picking back up with three more talks um, after, after that. All right, thank you again. And we can end this uh, this talk now.